Jones Family Farm in Massey, Maryland. Part of the family includes some 3,000 plus dairy cattle. We milk about 1,400 head of cattle a day and farm a little over 2,000 acres, mostly to support those cattle with feed. And growing a consistent supply of high quality feed is a top priority for farmer Sean Jones. So we're growing corn, which we cut for silage, as well as barley grain. And we also grow some of the protein side for our cattle in the form of soybeans. But like any farm, all these crops are threatened by an age-old nemesis, weeds. What's this? Is this henbit? That's henbit. Right, we got henbit, velvet leaf. There's a pokeweed. Oh, lovely. On this day in late June, Sean is joined by Mike Twining from Willard Agriservice to inspect some of his cornfields. Weeds compete with the crop for nutrients, for sunlight, for moisture, all things critical to growing a plant. Plus, weeds can clog up harvesting equipment and ruin feed. Certain weeds have very off odors and smell, but they also reduce the amount of digestible nutrients that I can put in that cow when I start filling those pounds up with weeds. So we need to take care of these things so that I have the best possible feed. Thankfully, Sean and Mike were prepared for this, as one of the ag services Willard provides is custom pesticide application, in this case, herbicide. There was actually about three different products in the tank that synergistically worked together to control weeds. We were applying this field at a rate of 20 gallons per acre, and even at the 20 gallons per acre, most of that is water. And in less than a week, the only green thing left should be corn. Whether targeting insects, plants, or other organisms, chemicals are an integral part of modern agriculture. But their popularity comes with no shortage of controversy. From environmental damage, to cancer lawsuits, to the rise of superweeds, nearly a century of pesticide use has created some unintended consequences. So why don't farmers just quit using them? Well, as seen in these test plots at the University of Maryland Y Research and Education Center, out-of-control weeds can do major damage. This is what it would look like if a farmer did not do any type of weed control whatsoever. And that's used to provide us with a nice contrast to our plots that have actually been sprayed. Dr. Kurt Vollmer is a weed management specialist, and he's testing a variety of herbicides in this soybean field. His goal? To share that research with farmers. As far as weed control goes, we want to try to make it as economical as possible. Farmers want to know what's the best and most efficient way to control these weeds. Not all herbicides are equal. Different chemical modes of action make some plant families susceptible and others naturally immune. Some herbicides will specifically target photosynthesis. Some might target chlorophyll development. Other herbicides are designed to target amino acid production that is exclusive to plants. In the 1990s, scientists took this one step further, creating genetically engineered crops with built-in resistance, making it possible to spray an entire field and only kill the weeds. Advancements like this help farmers use less spray and use it more effectively. Our use of herbicides with all this new knowledge we've gained in the past 50 years has become more precise and controlled. We're also using herbicides that are a lot safer than they were 50 or so years ago. In part because increasing regulations forced products to be safer. And that regulation is really important. For example, in order to get a pesticide registered, there are 120 to 140 base studies that have to be done. These include, you know, just general efficacy, but also toxicology. To protect both people and the environment, each pesticide must have a detailed label with restrictions on how and when to apply it, 
what protective gear to wear, and a required waiting period before harvesting a crop that was sprayed. The labels and the approval for the chemistry that we use is handled through the Environmental Protection Agency, but it also has to meet rigid requirements put out by the USDA and the Food and Drug Administration because we have to ensure that you know, there's not residues left on the crop, that the workers who are applying them are safe. Plus, all pesticide users have to earn a license and attend yearly classes. Generally, it's between eight to 10 hours of education every year. And I have to submit proof of that education and, and those credits and prove that I still have the knowledge that I need to do that safely. Of course, even with these regulations, an increasing number of consumers concerned about pesticide use are choosing organic food grown without any synthetic chemicals at all. And we'll talk more about that later. Meanwhile, a week has passed at Joan's family farm, and nearly all the weeds are gone. Yet the corn looks better than ever. We're certainly not in the habit of over-applying chemicals. We want to do a very responsible job for it, keep their usage to a minimum. It's just economically favorable to us. It's just one of many tools Sean uses to make sure his farm stays productive and profitable. Obviously, we're in the business to make milk and grow in vegetables. We're extremely concerned with the safety of the milk that we have, the, the food that the cattle eat, and the vegetables that we're growing. Joan's family farm was featured in the very first season of Maryland Farm and Harvest, almost nine years ago. To watch that story and others, check out our YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe while you're there.